Hi everyone, I'm Doug from DigiPen in Redmond. In this video, we'll learn about a powerful tool that makes game programming much easier. Functions. We programmers are faced with a bit of a problem. As we write our programs, our code grows. As it grows, it can get scarier, harder to follow, and more of a pain to fix bugs as we encounter them. One solution to this problem is called functions. A function is a portable container of code. Functions are also known as procedures or subroutines. Scratch lists them in the My Blocks category. To use a function, first you create the container, then you put code in it. Finally, you run the container by calling it, that is, you put a copy of the container in your program with the rest of the code. This may be a little confusing at first, so Let's look at an example that illustrates why you would want to use functions in the first place. Imagine you work at a warehouse. You need to move a bunch of boxes from the floor to a conveyor belt. Luckily, you have a robot that you can program to do this for you. Here's how the robot works. After you flip its power switch, you give it a sequence of commands. First, you need to tell it to activate its vision and movement systems so it can move around the warehouse floor. Then, for each box you need to move, you need the robot to stand next to it and pick it up. Then it needs to go to the conveyor belt and put the box down. Then, it can move on to the next box until it's moved them all. After the last box, it needs to shut down its vision and movement systems, and then you can turn it off. How might we think about telling the robot to do all of this? Let's imagine writing these instructions in a big list. First, the robot needs to activate its photoelectric sensor arrays that is, its eyes. And then it must extend its ambulatory pneumatic actuators, also known as its legs. Then the robot needs to move to the location of the first box. Then it needs to bend over. Then it needs to extend its arms. Then it needs to grasp the box. Then it needs to move over to the conveyor belt. Then it needs to bend over. Then it needs to let go of the box. After it's done this with the last box, it needs to deactivate its legs and then its eyes. There, now we have a program for a robot that can pick up and put down boxes. We're making real waves in the robotics industry here. Let's just copy and paste this list of instructions and modify it for each box in the warehouse. Yikes, this list is really long and awkward. Well, it still beats moving the boxes yourself. Let's run it and see what happens. Oh no, it failed right away! The robot needs to stand up again before it moves, or it will bump into things. To fix this, we need to tell the robot to stand up after grasping the box and after setting it down. Looks like we'll have to add this instruction for every box. Hmm, this is a bit of a pain, isn't it? Okay, it looks like we've got it. Let's run it again. Oh dear, it knocked over the boss's genuine Imperial Ming vase. This is because we forgot to make it pull its arms back to its sides after putting the box on the conveyor belt. Now we have to insert this instruction too, after every box it puts down. This is really getting annoying. There's got to be a better way of doing this. Well, 
let's examine the list of instructions we have written so far. Do you see any patterns? It looks like every time the robot picks up a box, we use this same set of four instructions. Earlier, we talked about containers of code that we can use to make our programs better. Let's put these four instructions in their own container, a separate list. This list is what we call a function. We'll name this function pickupBox. Now, in our main program, we can get rid of all these instructions to bend over and grasp boxes and so on, and in their place, we can just write pickupBox. This is what is known as calling a function. Look at our list now. It's much tidier and easier to follow. Can we do more? Let's continue to analyze our code. It looks like whenever we want the robot to put a box down, we use another set of instructions. We can make another separate function for these as well, named put down box. Let's replace these instructions with calls to this function. This is much better now. Our code is neat and tidy, and there's a lot less of it. And if we ever change our mind about how the robot should manipulate boxes, we can make these changes in these two functions, regardless of how many boxes we have to move. But we can do even more. At the start of the program, before the robot can get moving, we need it to activate its vision and its movement systems. We only do this once, but let's put it in a function anyway. This will help make the code look even tidier. We'll call this function startup, since it runs when we start the robot. And at the end, after the last box has been put away, the robot needs to shut down these same systems. Let's move these instructions into a shutdown function. This scenario demonstrates two of the main benefits of using functions, code reuse and code organization. If we have code we want to reuse throughout a program, like the instructions to make the robot pick up a box, it's better to put that code in a function than to copy and paste the code in different places in the program. And even if we have code that will only be used in one place in our program, it's still helpful to put it in a well-named function of its own just to keep things tidy and organized. Let's apply what we've learned in this video by adding functions to the Scratch Invaders game we started a while ago. Load what you've already done in that project, or visit the link in the description below, and then click the See Inside button. Make sure your hero sprite is selected, then take a look at the main stack of code that's attached to the start block in the code area. There isn't too much code here right now, so you might be inclined to think that there's no need to use functions yet. As a matter of fact, this is the perfect time to use them before things get any more complicated. First, let's organize our code into its large main categories. The first thing that happens when the green flag is clicked is that the hero speed variable is set to its initial value. This is known as initializing the variable. Let's create a function that will initialize all of the game's variables. We only have one right now, but surely we will add more soon. Here's how to make a function in Scratch. Click the pink My Blocks category on the left, and then click the Make a Block button in the block palette. The Make a Block dialog will appear. In the Block Name field, type the name we want to give to the function, Initialize. Then click the OK button. Take a look at the block palette. The Initialize block has been added to the My Blocks category. 
A define block for our new function has also been added to the code area. Any code we attach to the initialize function's define block is known as the body of the function, and it will be run every time the initialize block is run. Let's move the set block that initializes the hero speed variable into the body of the initialize function. Separate the set block from the start block by dragging it away a little bit. Then separate the forever block from the set block in the same way. Attach the forever block to the start block. Finally, attach the set block to the initialize function's define block. We're not quite done yet, though. We've defined the body of the function, but we're not calling it anywhere. Find the initialize block in the block palette. Drag it into the code area and attach it between the start block and the forever block. Now we have a handy place to initialize any new variables we add to the game. Let's continue our organization efforts. Inside the forever block is the main loop of the game. This stack of if-then blocks is executed again and again as long as the game is running, and it handles all of the hero's movement. Let's move these blocks into another new function and call that function in the forever loop instead. In the block palette, Click the Make a Block button. The Make a Block dialog will appear. Name the new function... Well, what should we name it? It's designed to handle all of the hero's movement, so we could name it Handle Hero Movement, or Movement, or Handle Movement, or anything like that. Let's go with Handle Movement. Type that name in the block name field, and then click OK. As before, the handle movement block has been added to the block palette, and a define block for our new function has been added to the code area. Let's move the movement code from the forever loop into the body of the handle movement function. Drag the top if-then block away from the forever block that contains it, and be careful not to drag one of the blocks inside the if-then block. Attach this stack of blocks to the handle movement function's define block. Then, in the block palette, find the handle movement block. Drag it into the code area and attach it inside the mouth of the forever block. Now our code looks much neater than it did before. We can use functions more and more as we continue to develop our game. Let's recap what we covered in this video. First, we learned that a function is a portable container of code. We learned that you can put code in a function and then run that code by calling the function in a program. Next, we imagined a box-moving robot and the instructions we would need to operate it. We made it easier to maintain and reuse the instructions in the robot's program by creating the pickup box and put down box functions and we made the program even better organized with the start up and shut down functions. Finally, we improved our Scratch Invaders game by creating functions and moving our code into them. In the next video, we'll continue to improve our space shooter by adding a shoot function.